Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for deciding to tune into our webinar this afternoon instead of enjoying a cold drink outside on this summer's day. Uh, my name is Alicia Ogawa. I'm director of the project on Japanese corporate governance and stewardship. Our project is a forum to seek to exchange best practices from Japan, Europe, UK, and US uh, in order to understand what we can learn from each other. And to that end, I've invited two special guests today. Uh, we have Mark Goldstein from Institutional Shareholder Services. Uh, Mark is in charge of US research these days, but previously he spent a long time running research for the ISS Tokyo office in Japan. Um, for students who might be on this call who are not so familiar with what ISS does, ISS is one of two of the um, one of two major so-called proxy advisor companies. They do research on all of the proposals that are being made at all of the shareholder meetings that take place all over the world. And they make recommendations to asset managers as to how their vote should be cast or the best way to cast their vote. Um, our second speaker is Mr. Kondo from the Tokyo Stock Exchange. And he's going to share his views on the special challenges that were posed by the recent events in running the shareholder meetings. And also he'll talk a little bit about his institution's plans for dealing with the longer term issues. So it's been six years since the stewardship code was introduced in Japan. And I thought it might be worthwhile to look at the recent shareholder meetings as a barometer of the progress that has been made uh, in holding asset managers accountable for the way they run their money. Um, where can we see progress? Well, in the first place, it seems increasingly uh, that domestic Japanese institutional investors find it increasingly comfortable to vote against entrenched management and to vote against their candidates or their proposals. Um, on the other hand, uh, the number of proposals coming from shareholders uh, continues to grow every year. Um, and support for those shareholder proposals continues to grow. But the fact is that very few of these proposals actually pass, actually get the level of approval needed. Um, there have been exceptions, and some of the ones that astound me are uh, a foreign activist who succeeded in putting its chief officer on the board of Olympus. And earlier this year, a activist uh, succeeded in voting out four directors at Suncorp and installing three of his own candidates on the board. But these are very, very unusual. Um, recently in the United States, I've heard some of my friends at International Corporate Governance Network talk about how the US is now entering a third stage of corporate governance. The first stage which is the very basics of getting shareholder rights strengthened and getting board procedures and board nominations um, standardized, all the mechanics of setting up committees and holding them accountable and so on. The second stage which we're sort of coming to the end of is the ESG stage, the so-called environmental social and governance stage. The third stage that I start to hear people talk about is the so-called stakeholder revolution, where asset managers should, or some people feel, should take ownership of things like securing biodiversity of the planet or human capital management uh, and those kinds of long-term big picture uh, issues which many people feel government is not being successful at addressing. Um, last year, for example, 60% of shareholder proposals in the United States were related either to climate, climate change, gender pay gaps, disclosure of political contributions and lobbying activities, and so on and so forth. Where there were proposals that dealt with board members, um, the proposals were not dealing with the basics of board structure, independence, but rather with the performance of individuals who are serving on the boards of US companies. So when we compare Japan, Japan is very much, I think, it's still, sta still in stage one. Um, in the United States, 85% of board directors on the S&P companies are independent, meaning they don't come from inside the company. Um, by contrast, in Japan, we're still struggling to get three or four independent directors elected to the board. Many shareholder proposals in Japan are simply uh, efforts to get the management to understand their cost of capital and to improve the efficiency of their balance sheets. So in my view, uh, Japan has done really very, 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 very little on the E and the S of ESG, 
because there's still so much work to do in Japan on the G. Having said that, there was a proposal this year in Japan for the very first time uh, dealing with climate change, and I believe that Mark is going to talk a bit about that. So again, the purpose of this, of this uh, discussion is to talk about the ways in which the global pandemic really wreaked havoc on the shareholder meetings, both in, in the United States and Japan. Um, each of our speakers is going to discuss uh, the impact this had on both the process of holding the meeting and the substance of the meeting. Did the circumstances of the pandemic make people more or less sensitive to making demands on the company? Um, in addition, in Japan, this was the first year that foreign investors had to deal with a very important new regime, monitoring investment in Japanese companies by overseas investors. Uh, to simplify this issue down to ridiculous, I just to sum it up in one minute, which is very difficult, the new rules require that foreign investors need to ask permission of the government before they acquire more than 1% of the stock of any company that the government deems is of national security interest. Um, and the foreign investors even have to ask permission in many cases to even vote for certain proposals um, that other people are making in these types of companies that the government feels have uh, special interest in terms of national security. When the first draft of these rules was announced back in the fall of 2019, here in New York, I could smell the fire, the fire, investors' hair on fire uh, in reaction to these rules um, because the first version seemed on the surface to be really targeted at stopping shareholder activism. I'm glad to say that the final version, which we are dealing with now, is much more practical than the first version. And I think a lot of investors heaved a sigh of relief. I've heard some people make the point that, in fact, it's actually much more transparent and predictable in the process in the United States, which is probably true. But as we have seen in one major test case in Japan just last month, we can't be sure whether or not the Japanese government will resist the temptation to bend its own rules to protect certain companies from activist shareholders. So that's it for me. A few housekeeping rules. The format is that each speaker is going to make comments for between five and 10 minutes. I'll pitch a few questions to them, and then I'll open it up to the floor. So I encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A box, and uh, I hope that you make them difficult because we have some very thoughtful and experienced and opinionated people on the panel, um, and so please do. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce Mark Goldstein. Mark has been with ISS for, I think, two decades or so, and he now runs, as I mentioned, U.S. equity, re the U.S. research. Earlier, he ran research for ISS in Tokyo. And I would ask you to read both his biography and Mr. Kondo's biography off in your own time because their accomplishments and their certifications are so numerous that I could take up half the time here just reading them. So please go ahead and read them on your own. I guarantee you'll be impressed. So Mark, may I turn it over to you? Sir, <clears throat> certainly. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining today's event. Uh, thanks, of course, to Alicia and the team at Columbia for organizing it. Uh, as Alicia indicated, I'd like to start by talking about what we might call the logistical issues arising from the pandemic, meaning shareholder meetings getting adjourned or postponed, moving online. Uh, and then I'd like to talk about uh, the impact on some substantive corporate governance issues, uh, such as what was the impact on companies' capital strategies, their takeover defenses, their response to activist shareholders, as well as what it means for ESG-oriented investing. So starting with the logistics, uh, because Japanese fiscal years end on March 31st for most companies, the pandemic was already impacting business before the fiscal year end, especially at companies with significant operations or supply chains in China. So going into proxy season, there was concern that many companies would not be able to get their financial statements audited in time to be presented at a June annual meeting, meaning that the company would have to either adjourn or postpone the meeting. Japanese law is very clear that the audited financials need to be presented at the annual meeting. Now, incidentally, this was less of a concern in the US because most annual meetings held during this proxy season were for the fiscal years that ended on December 31st, well before the impact of the pandemic began to be felt. But in the end, adjournments and postponements of Japanese meetings were much less of a problem than anticipated 
only about 90 companies adjourned or postponed their meetings, and most of the postponements were just for a few weeks. That was a great relief to Japanese institutional investors who often rely on temporary workers or borrow employees from other divisions to handle the proxy season workload, and who had worried that they might have to keep those temporary workers on all summer to handle postponed meetings. And now there were some delays in companies releasing their meeting materials. On average, these were released one day closer to the meeting date than last year. I'm sure that doesn't sound like much, but if you have to vote 2,000 meetings in June, as many of our clients do, that one day does make a difference. Uh, still, things could have been much worse. I don't think anyone is really complaining about the timing. Most of us still remember the not so distant past when Japanese companies would mail out proxy, uh, paper copies of the proxy circulars 15 days before the meeting date. Uh, we were lucky to get them uh, in, in time to, uh, to vote. Now, what about virtual meetings? So in Delaware and many other US states, companies are allowed to hold virtual shareholder meetings. They don't even necessarily have to ask shareholder permission to do it. Uh, in fact, a majority of US companies did hold virtual meetings this year. In some cases, uh, these were required simply to comply with local restrictions on public gatherings. But even if those local restrictions didn't apply, uh, companies wanted to protect the health of their shareholders, their directors, and their employees. Uh, even investors who ordinarily prefer an in-person meeting were, of course, willing to be flexible this year. Now, in Japan, virtual-only meetings are not allowed. So companies held in-person meetings, but then asked shareholders to please not attend uh, and let them know that there would be no gifts for attendees this year. Japanese companies are allowed to webcast those in-person meetings, and many did so this year, but many of those webcasts were not interactive uh, and shareholders were not always able to submit questions. So turning to the substantive corporate governance issues, let's start with poison pills. In the US, there was a surge in adoption of poison pills by companies that were worried about an opportunistic accum accumulation of shares by an activist or would-be acquirer at prices that did not reflect the company's long-term fair value. We counted over 50 of these new pills, most of which had a duration of one year or less, and most of which were not put to a shareholder vote. By contrast, in Japan, we only counted four new pills, all of which were put to a shareholder vote. But then there were 80 other Japanese companies that sought approval to renew their existing pills, many of which have been in place for a decade or more. Now, what does it mean for a company to have, in effect, a permanent takeover defense? The companies that put these pills in place always say that this is not about entrenchment, that they're open to being acquired under the right conditions at the right price. So keeping a pill in place for 10 or 15 years essentially means that the company doesn't believe the market will ever give it an appropriate valuation. But really, that's just another way of saying that either management doesn't know what steps to take to ensure that the company is fully valued, or it knows but simply doesn't want to take those steps, which may include increasing balance sheet efficiency, selling down cross shareholdings, or exiting unprofitable businesses. These are what activists in Japan tend to focus on, unsurprisingly. Now, activism in Japan has definitely continued despite the pandemic, uh, although I believe uh, Kondo-san will discuss later on that activists' specific requests have changed somewhat. I have to say that many Japanese companies are no doubt feeling vindicated with respect to the cash on their balance sheets these days when they see how quickly their overseas counterparts ran out of money and had to furlough or lay off employees or seek a government bailout. In fact, the pandemic has caused many people in the US to reassess the priority given to share buybacks and to see the virtues of keeping cash in reserve. But if US companies represent one extreme when it comes to balance sheet management, Japanese companies represent the other. Let's take Kiens as an example. This is an industrial electronics firm. Kiens used to brag that it had enough cash to keep operating even if it had no revenues for 17 years. Now think about what that means. It means that Kian's employees would come to work every day, designing and building products that no one wanted to buy for 17 years. That sounds like a Twilight Zone episode, doesn't it? I mean, it's a horrible waste of society's resources, if that were ever to come to pass. But keeping that much cash on the balance sheet instead of allowing it to be used productively is also a waste of resources. Uh, and that's why I believe there's still a place for shareholder activism in Japan, notwithstanding 
the pandemic or other recent events. Alicia spoke earlier about uh, environmental, social, and governance issues. So in light of the pandemic, some commentators were predicting that a focus on ESG issues is a luxury that investors can no longer afford, uh, that investors will be chasing returns wherever they can get them. This was wishful, wishful thinking on the part of those commentators, I think. ESG is best thought of as a risk management strategy. Uh, to take the US as an example, the pandemic has made clear to many people the risks to companies of not providing health insurance or paid sick leave to workers, of not providing a safe working environment. Another example, and this is very definitely not just the US, is that a number of energy companies around the world are writing down the value of their oil and gas and coal assets as prices and demand remain low. This is something that environmental activists had predicted would happen one day, but no one was predicting it would happen quite so soon. So investors are still very much focused on ESG issues because these represent risks to the value of the investment. In the US, shareholder proposals on environmental and social issues are gaining unprecedented support. 20 such proposals passed this year, which is a new record. Unfortunately, however, that success has brought a backlash as the business community has been pressuring the SEC to raise the ownership threshold for submitting a shareholder proposal. An even more extreme response has come from the Labor Department, which has issued guidance intended to make it more difficult for pension funds to invest according to ESG criteria. So what about Japan? Well, in Japan too, investors continue to care about these issues. In the past, we've seen shareholder proposals that arguably fall under the ENS umbrella, but they've tended to be unique to Japan. For example, the anti-nuclear power proposals at the electric utilities or proposals from the labor unions at JR East and West. But this year, uh, as Alicia mentioned, there was a shareholder proposal at Mizuho Financial Group, which was very similar to proposals we've seen at banks in the US and the UK and other countries. It asked Mizuho for annual disclosure of its strategy to align its financing activities with the goals of the Paris Agreement. The proponents pointed out in particular that Mizuho is a major lender to coal power projects, which incidentally is also the case for Japan's other me mega banks. Now the proposal was formally presented as a request for Mizuho to amend its articles of incorporation to require such disclosure. By law, article amendments in Japan require support from two thirds of the votes cast so the proposal didn't pass, but it was supported by 35% of shareholders who voted. That's very impressive for a first time proposal that Japanese shareholders aren't used to seeing. Uh, and incidentally, it wasn't just overseas shareholders who supported it, lest you be tempted to think this was just a matter of, of the foreigners trying to dictate what Japan should do. Uh, foreign shareholders don't even own 35% of Mizuho in total, and not all of them would have supported this proposal. And by the way, the proposal received that level of support even after Mizuho had already enhanced its disclosure and pledged not to provide loans to any new coal-fired power plant projects going forward. So other companies definitely took notice of this, especially Sumitomo Mitsui Financial Group, which made its own pledge to stop lending to new coal plants. I think we're, this means we're likely to see more such proposals in the future because after all, the, the point isn't to have the proposal pass necessarily, but to have an impact on corporate behavior. So Alicia, back to you. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I can't help but tell you the story when you're talking about virtual meetings. I once attended a meeting in London where a very an elderly, um, specialist on corporate governance was talking about how in the UK virtual meetings are now the rule and he's telling us that the first UK company um, to have a virtual meeting he said and I'm, I'm emphasizing that he was sort of old and not exactly a fashionista he said first virtual company was a company called Jimmy Choo I believe they make shoes and all the ladies in the audience laughed obviously well, um, our next speaker is Mr. Kondo. Mr. Kondo is the Deputy General Manager of the Tokyo Stock Exchange New York office. And he's been here for a year in New York. And he is responsible for promoting all the topics listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange and its services, including uh, market data and ITT connectivity. Um, he has a deep academic background in computer science and especially AI. Uh, and he's been involved in some of the new regulatory enhancements at the exchange. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Kondo-san. 
Okay, thank you for the introduction. I am Masahumi Kondo, a representative in Tokyo Stock Exchange New York office, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining today's event. So as Mark mentioned, the fiscal years end in March for most Japanese companies, and the number of the companies listed on TSE whose fiscal year ended in March was around 2,300 of the companies and they're out of about 3,700 TS listed companies. So in the operation of the year end book closing and its audit, as well as holding AGM on those companies were affected by COVID-19 as Japan declared the state of emergency in early April. So today I'd like to share this year's trend on the schedules and the methods of holding AGMs by those companies. And I'll also talk about the latest trend of shareholder activism in Japan. So firstly, regarding the schedules, Japanese companies are required by law to hold AGM within three months after the end of fiscal year. But there were roughly 100 companies which, which couldn't meet the deadline, mainly due to the, the, the impact co caused by COVID-19. So then more than half of those companies postponed their AGMs by changing the record date to determine shareholders' eligibility for voting at AGM and receiving dividend. And the rest of the companies held AGMs on the normal date to discuss the agenda other than the financial results and were planning to hold an extra AGM separately later on to just report the financial results to shareholders because this is required by Japanese law. However, both of them were criticized from different aspect. Changing the record date to postpone the AGM itself was attacked by some retail investors complaining that it was a violation of shareholders' rights. On the other hand, some institutional investors pointed out that it is totally nonsense to discuss or vote for the amount of dividend or the new board members without the latest financial results. So this is the first topic. And next, I'd like to share this year's trend on the methods of holding AGMs in Japan. So not only Japan, but across the world, online AGM has been the hot topic this year. And in the United States, for example, as Mark mentioned, nearly 3,000 companies held their AGMs online this year. On the other hand, Japanese corporation company law required the AGM to be held in a place which can actually accommodate shareholders who want to attend in person. So in other words, Japanese companies cannot hold AGM fully online. Actually, the interpretation of this regulation has been an argument in Japan since the onset of COVID-19 crisis, but it has not been changed yet. So holding AGM in hybrid style and encouraging their shareholders to attend AGM online was found to be the best alternative for Japanese companies this year. However, among the 2,300 companies whose fiscal year ended in March this year, the hybrid AGM was held only by about 10 companies, not 10%, just 10 companies out of more than 2,000 companies. Even, even the number of the companies who just broadcasted their AGMs without accepting questions or accepting voting online was roughly 100 companies just broadcasted was 100 companies. So out of 2,300 companies whose fiscal year ended in March this year. So it was a very limited number. So other companies just encouraged their shareholders to exercise voting rights in advance of the AGM instead of coming in person. But uh, I would say it's not sufficient in terms of respecting shareholders' rights during this COVID-19 crisis. So how to hold AGM has become a new issue for Japanese companies in this post-COVID world. Actually, this is, it has been an issue for a long time, especially in terms of the convenience for foreign investors, but it has become much more critical at the moment. So this is the second topic. And lastly, 
let me share the trend of the shareholder activism in Japan. So this year, roughly 55 companies received shareholder proposals, and the two, 23 of them received from foreign activists. And both figures are the record high in Japan. Actually, in the past, there was an idea among Japanese people that the proposals from activists was very, very drastic. But actually, such proposals are regarded as more realistic these days. And the way they engage with Japanese companies has also become, let's say, more constructive rather than hostile. So also, given the impact caused by COVID-19 this year, some articles or news, including Nikkei, mentioned that there was the trend, especially this year, to focus on requesting improvement of corporate governance rather than to demand direct shareholder returns. However, as for the number of such proposals like share buybacks or dividend increases, there has not changed so much compared with last year. So I would say the focusing on the improvement of corporate governance, this is more long-term trend in Japanese market rather than the temporary trend caused by COVID-19 this year. As a result, the realistic proposals from activists have been more accepted by other shareholders even in Japan. So as Arishu mentioned in the opening remarks, still there has been a little case which gained the majority of the voting at the AGM, but the ratio of shareholder proposals, which were supported by more than 20% of votes by shareholders, was 45% this year. So I mean the 45% of shareholder proposals gained more than 20% of supports from shareholders, while it was only 37% last year. So there was 8% increase since last year. So, you know, basically the 20% support levels cannot be achieved only by activists who proposed. So especially for small foreign activists. So this figure shows the ongoing changes of the other shareholders view on proposals from activists. And uh, also the trend for Japanese company to accept board members nominated by activists has been also increasing. So last year, for example, Olympus accepted a board member from Value Act, and uh, Kawasaki Kisen accepted a board member from Efishimo. And this year, for example, a plastic manufacturing company called Tenma accepted a board member from Dalton Investment. And this nomination was supported by the majority of its shareholders. And also interestingly, the share price of this company jumped around 10% after they announced that they decided to accept a board member from the activist. So this is an example that shows a growing number of investors in Japan expect activists to improve the value of the companies. So in summary, so actually there was a confusion in the case of some companies in terms of the schedules of the AGM caused by COVID-19 crisis this year and how Japanese companies can hold more effective AGMs in this post-COVID world is still unsolved problem. But however, even though, as Alicia mentioned, the controversial amendment of foreign exchange and the foreign trade act recently came into force, but I can say the shareholder activism in Japan has been robust and steadily progressing even in this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kondo-san. Um, I want to push on something that you said, which I, I was just thinking about. When we're talking about shareholder proposals, proposals coming from the investors to the company, and the fact that they're increasing in number is a sign that activism is alive and working and so on. But on the other hand, um, investors only make shareholder proposals when they cannot convince the company on their own, right? Mm. If you're an activist investor, the first thing you want to do is have a discussion with the management and say, oh, look, we have an idea and here's our presentation about how it could help your company. And they hope that that will be successful. But so on the one hand, the number of shareholder proposals increasing shows that management is at first pushing back. Mm -hmm. But the fact that, you, as you point out, 
investors are supporting these shareholder proposals shows that companies had better be, be careful because it's not just one investor who might have this idea about how to improve the company. So it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic, I think. Thank you very much for your views and for Mark. So I, I'd like to start off the questions and I would encourage uh, anybody in the audience to ask questions, starting with this new Foreign Exchange Act, which I think uh, you know, at first created enormous alarm. Foreign investors really thought that this was directed at them, directed at, at stopping them from having any influence in Japanese companies. When we saw the final version, it turned out to be much more uh, practical and reasonable, but yet we don't have very many test cases yet. So we don't really know where the lines are firmly drawn. Um, one of the people who was on the line who's attending is an old friend and client of mine from BlackRock. And he asked the question, what is behind this law? And is it a backward step for covered corporate governance? Can I ask you two to respond to that? I certainly have opinions, but Mark, why don't we start with you? Yeah, uh, I also got an inquiry from uh, one of our large uh, asset manager clients outside Japan who was wondering the same thing. And I think essentially they were uh, uh, certainly relieved to, to realize that, uh, you know, uh, passive investors are not treated the same way as activists. And it's essentially the, the 13D versus 13G uh, distinction in the US. Uh, and so asset managers aren't going to find themselves suddenly uh, subjected to enormous uh, onerous burdens simply from uh, increasing their, their stake in a portfolio company. Uh, as for the uh, distinction between certain you know, sensitive sectors, uh, I, obviously, people take will need to take time to adjust to wh which companies are are impacted. But these things uh, exist in in many many markets. Certainly not unique to Japan, uh, uh, and to some extent, Japan has had similar rules, uh, perhaps narrower, but that has said, had similar rules for a long time. You might recall when uh, TCI tried to invest in J Power some years ago, they, they ran up against uh, a limitation. They couldn't go above 10% uh, in the US as well. The broadcast companies, you may re recall that Rupert Murdoch had to become a US citizen in order to uh, essentially turn a collection of TV stations into the Fox network uh, and run a TV network in the US. Uh, many, many countries and, and uh, if a uh, foreign company were to buy uh, a US company in the defense sector or, or certain sensitive technology areas, they would run into CFIUS and other, other problems that would prevent them from doing it. Yeah, I think it's worth noting that uh, the US regime is actually much less transparent and harsher. And that uh, it's interesting to me when I looked up 2019 is the last year we have data for, but the number of, of, of filings or the number of requests made by foreign investors to acquire uh, American companies, the lead country was Japan, which had 46 uh, requests. Uh, China was a distant second. Uh, so it works both ways. And uh, mm -hmm. all the people I talk to in national security in several countries say this is a trend which is just going to keep getting uh, tighter and tighter and tighter. It's just going to accelerate. Um, so I'm not sure that Japan is really, uh, you know, an outlier. I think, and again, the, I think the final version uh, of the rules, you know, seems to be more predictable and more transparent than many other countries. You were talking about poison pills, and I was reminded that I, I've been reading that in Poland, uh, talking about foreign investment, because of the collapse in share prices due to the pandemic in Poland, they're so afraid of their companies being acquired by foreigners that they're not allowing any country in the world to acquire more than, I believe it's 7% of a Polish company. No quote of any company, whether it's a diaper mm -hmm. company or a munitions company or an electric power company, you can't own any Polish company because I guess they feel their whole country would just be snatched up at bargain basement prices. Yeah, and well, one, one thing the pandemic has brought is renewed attention to uh, supply chains. And, and uh, certainly in the US, people are talking about uh, the, the need to develop domestic manufacturing capabilities, not for missiles or guidance systems, but for things like uh, face masks and, and uh, basic pharmaceutical ingredients. Right. Real estate is also uh, a sensitive sector in both countries and in America and yes. 
down as well. Yeah. Um, can I ask you, to the extent that you can talk about it, has this made your job at ISS when you are um, deciding whether to promote certain recommendations or to rule on various proposals, does the fact that this might be in a, in a more sensitive uh, category of national security, does that interfere or, or color your recommendation at all? Uh, it, it hasn't really to date, uh, not saying it couldn't ever in the future, but uh, my Tokyo colleagues uh, tell me that it really didn't have much of an impact uh, this year. Okay. Um, I have a question for Kondo-san. Um, when the first proposals came out in October, uh, and again, that first version was so extreme, so restrictive, um, every foreign investor was so upset uh, because it, feared, it seemed to be an attack on shareholder rights, particularly foreign shareholder rights, and the president of your organization, JPX, was quoted in the FT, uh, Financial Times, he said that he considered the first version of these rules, quote unquote, idiotic, and uh, a threat to Japan's standing in global financial markets. Um, that was amazing to me that he said that. <laughs> um, but of course, a lot of trading on the Tokyo Stock Exchange comes from foreign investors. So what is your view of how foreign investors have come to view these new rules? Do you sense that they have uh, decided that they are workable? Or is, do you see foreign investors saying, this is really not a friendly environment? What's your view? Yes, actually, as you mentioned, the many foreign investors have complained the limitation of the information available in English, especially mm -hmm. in its early stage. But as the situation was eventually improved, as the details of the amendment get clear, and it turned out that most foreign investors wouldn't be affected thanks to its wide scope of exemption rules in the end. And let me add one specific example. The restriction on the voting for the proposal to elect a closely related person had been one of the major concerns among foreign activists. However, under the final version of these new rules, the most board members nominated by activists in the past fell outside of the definition. So actually, activists in Japan tend not to nom nominate their own staff to board in any case. So we didn't observe a big impact of the Fifth Amendment on the AGM season this year. But however, it, it's no doubt that uh, there, it does affect the operation on activists and they've been struggling with this complicated new regulation. But I, I received an interesting feedback from an activist that uh, some of them, some of the investors have this opportunity positively to officially position themselves as investors who actively interact with the companies in which they invest. So in fact, during the process to enact this amendment, the Japanese Monetary Finance repeatedly explained that they did not intend to disturb shareholder activism with this amendment. Rather, they said it was solely for national security purpose. So some investors interpreted it as it was officially confirmed by the government that activism is not evil in Japan or activism is totally healthy in Japan. So it has become more clear that before this amendment, the, it was a bit unclear that if uh, the shareholder proposal is evil or bad things or they are bad or goodies, but now it's clear that at least they submit application in advance, exercising activism is totally fair and no problem. Yeah. That's my view. Thank you for that answer. I have a really interesting question from a friend who is a board, he's, a, he's here in New York, but he's, on the, he's a board director at a Japanese company and he's a lawyer. And he says, do we have any idea how many settlements occurred between activists and companies so that there was no need to go through with a shareholder proposal? Um, I, I think I would answer by saying, you sometimes read that these things have happened. For example, in the case last year at Toshiba, there was one activist who was pushing a slate of independent directors. And at the end of the day, the CEO decided to make those nominations. In here in the United States, uh, I'm a consultant for one of the big activists who has gone public by saying 
we've made our peace. We're going to wait or we're, we have decided, you know, in the case of uh, AT&T or some other telecom companies, we're going to give them time to work it out. Do, do either of you, uh, Mark or Kondosan, have any idea of cases where this happened, where the activists' demands were welcomed or uh, accepted by the management so we didn't have to have a shareholder proposal? Can you think of any examples? Uh, it, it, my feeling is that they tend not to get publicized in, in the way that they do uh, in the U.S., uh, that perhaps in some cases the, the uh, price of getting the settlement is that the activist can't claim credit for it, <laughs> uh, not to embarrass management, uh, let management uh, appear to be acting proactively. Yep. Would you, would you regard, I mean, in the case of, of Third Point and FANUC, there was like a demand that they have uh, somebody who could talk to shareholders, right? And, and mm -hmm. FANUC did do that on their own, uh, maybe yeah. as getting rid of him. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly won't say that it ne it's never public or it, it's never apparent, uh, but, but I do think that there's, there is and has been for some time uh, activism that goes on behind the scenes in Japan, where the activists are very happy to not publicly take credit for changes that, uh, that they're really helping to bring about. Whereas in the US, uh, it's more likely, I believe, to be uh, open. Um, okay. Let's move on to uh, some of the proposals. Um, you talked so nicely about this, Mark, about, and so did Kondo-san, where you talk about, has the um, pandemic made activist shareholders or other shareholders kind of sensitive about demanding cash and dividends. And I think you both referred to the fact that, that you see that. Uh, so on the one hand, there is this uh, sensitivity to demanding cash. Give me a dividend, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, so no, I ha my records say that nine companies receive proposals for increased dividends this year, as opposed to 17 last year. So that's a fall by about 50%. But while the demand for increased dividends has softened somewhat, most of the proposals still deal with either share buybacks, please buy back some of your shares, or focusing companies on getting to sell their cross share holdings. Um, no. So can I ask you, Mark, to comment on the demands in Japan versus the United States on share buybacks um, I think you spoke a little bit about it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Japanese companies have been historically known for hoarding cash in excess of, of what they need, and U.S. companies sort of go to the other extreme, which is borrowing money to, for the purpose of buying back shares. Uh, and why do companies do that in the U.S.? Partly it's about rewarding their shareholders, partly it's about keeping activists at bay, Partly it's about boosting earnings per share if, the, if that is one of the metrics that's used to determine the CEO's compensation. Uh, but even before the pandemic, some people were expressing concern about excessive buybacks in the US and arguing that companies should devote more of their earnings to investing in the business or paying workers more. Uh, those voices have only gotten louder. You know, uh, Many people are frankly outraged that companies would continue to reward shareholders and executives while laying off workers or while seeking government bailouts. Particularly when the buybacks are being financed by borrowing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, you know, in the past few years, debt has been cheap. Companies have been able to borrow very cheaply to, to carry out buybacks, but it's not, it's not going to be, uh, the environment is not going to be the same uh, going forward. Now, most U.S. companies don't need to get shareholder approval to do this. They just, right. the board decides if we're going to buy back some shares. Uh, but there are a couple of categories uh, of companies that do have to put them to a vote cross-market companies and certain banks that are required by the regulators to do it. And so when we evaluated a buyback proposal this year in the U.S., we looked carefully at the company's press releases, SEC filings, to see, all right, have they laid off workers? Have they cut pay? Uh, have they sought financial assistance through the Paycheck Protection Program or some of the other government programs? In other words, is there a risk of reputational damage from the company just plowing ahead uh, with share buybacks as if nothing had happened? Uh, and, but Japanese companies, for the most part, you know, they're not laying off workers, they're not getting bailed out by the government, and they still have a lot of cash, and so that's less controversial if they decide to return some of it. But, uh, sorry. No, uh, I have a question from the audience, it's a good question. Um, he, uh, he asked, 
that he notes that one of your competitors has recently uh, indicated that it will advise voting against any management where cross shareholdings exceed a certain threshold. And his question is, um, does ISS anticipate uh, adopting such a such policy? I mean, the latest version of the stewardship code does say, you know, you had better, you had better deal with this. But um, yeah. how, how would you answer my friend here? Yeah, so uh, there is a question on our policy survey this year uh, on just this topic, uh, sort of exploring. Uh, uh, we haven't we haven't made a decision yet on, on policy updates for next year, but uh, we're thinking about it. We're talking about it. Um, we did amend our director independence definition for this year for 2020 uh, to make clear that uh, the representative of a company who holds the company shares or whose shares are held by the company in question uh, is not an independent director. In other words, doesn't matter which, which side uh, we're talking about. And if there's, a, if there's a strategic shareholding relationship, even if it's not strictly a cross shareholding relationship, uh, if these are strategic shareholdings that aren't for the purpose of uh, maximizing value, uh, that means that the, the, uh, any representative of that company can't be an independent director. Yeah, okay. I have a question, further question on cross shareholdings for Kondo-san, but let me make the comment because I know there's somebody on the line who, who lived through this, is that, you know, it was very distressing to me to see an activist who had, you know, very, very reasonable and mild proposals, not asking for a disposition of a business or firing the CEO, but simply adding very qualified people to the board and for a very reasonable amount of disclosure. And uh, the company's reaction was mm -hmm. to reform increased cross shareholdings with its peer group. So it went right out and uh, approached other companies in the same business and said, let's increase our cross shareholdings so we don't have to deal with this guy. And uh, you know, to me, that's very distressing. So I want to ask Kondo-san, um, you know, cross shareholding and allegiant shareholding, which you know, for for the students on this call, these shareholders form a wall around management, so that the other true investors can never acquire enough votes to make their proposals stick. So this this feature of the Japanese market, uh, cross shareholding and allegiant shareholding, still seems to be a key feature of the Japanese market that both foreign and domestic investors feel is an obstacle to better corporate governance. Um, and with the collapse of the market in, in March due to COVID, many companies really suffered unrealized losses on these shareholdings, um, which just again points out the danger and the lack of logic of investing this way, and yet very few, I'm not sure I can think of any proposals to encourage sale of cross shareholdings has passed, has, has gotten a majority of votes. So how do you, accept, how do you assess the progress in cross shareholdings, Kondo-san, and is your, the reform of your exchange that's being contemplated, are you guys thinking about any kind of rules that would encourage further sell-off of cross shareholdings? Okay, so first of all, if you see the statistics of the overall TSE market on the cross shareholdings or the uh, listed subsidiaries or something like that, so the overall figures has been improving in a decade, especially after the introduction of corporate governance code or stewardship code. And the TSC has been continuously facilitating the improvement of corporate governance or chapter management in Japanese market. And the, obviously the major initiative is the introduction and the continuous revision of Japanese corporate governance code, which addresses some major governance issues such as cross shareholdings or CEO pay. And besides this code, we are revising our listing and delisting criteria to incentivize listed companies to improve their corporate governance as a part of it. And we recently announced uh, an idea of the revising of the, the, of the listing and the delisting criteria, and it has been under public comment period right now. And also we launched a study group for improving the governance of listed subsidiaries in November last year. And it had been postponed because due to the COVID-19 crisis, but recently it resumed discussing again, and uh, we will make any required action on it once the study group published the results of the discussion. So we will keep 
working on it very hard. And uh, however, the, given these actions taken by TSE, I personally believe the last piece to actually achieve the governance improvement in Japanese market is healthy shareholder activism. The while, as you said, the rights of shareholders in the United States have been under attack recently, but Japan has still very in very early stage, and there is a big room to make greater use of the existing shareholders' rights for Japanese shareholders, which is not included only activists, but for all other Japanese investors. So exercising the shareholders' rights or proposing something or a board for shareholders' proposal, this is totally a fear and it's not evil. So expanding such practice in Japanese market is a key. So I would say the, uh, sorry, it sounds like the conclusion of today's event, but the rights of shareholder activism is the key of the rights of Japanese market. Yeah, so, but going back to the specific issue of cross-shareholding and reform of TSE, I saw in one of the early documents talking about explaining the revision of, of TSE, there were um, proposals for minimum liquidity, like how many shares traded or how many shareholders owned and so on and so forth. Do you think that those kinds of proposals will make it into the new reform? And do you think that those will help um, accelerate the dissolution of cross shareholdings? Yes, so creating a new regulation or revising our existing rules, it's of course necessary to improve this situation, but not always. Basically the cross shareholdings or the listed subsidiaries, it doesn't make sense, but some, in some case it could make sense for investors, shareholders. So we cannot uh, totally prohibit those activities. So that's why we included those things into corporate governance code rather than any regulation or uh, listed criteria. So the, the, part, the next step is the conversation between the companies and shareholders. So as I said, so I don't think just implementing a new regulation or just implementing a new guideline cannot make change Japanese companies' behaviors. But given the new guidelines or a CZ call and uh, start communicating with uh, shareholders, it, I believe it will improve the situation better. Thank you. Um, this whole conversation, again, you know, to my comment that Japan is in stage one of corporate governance, we're talking about balance sheet and we're talking about cross shareholding, we're talking about cash. And I'd like to talk about directors now a little bit and come back to these topics. Um, because Mark, in your opening remarks, you made some really interesting observations uh, and contrast between Japan and the US in terms of uh, poison pills. Um, so I wanted to ask you, why do you think that there are still you know, a healthy number of Japanese companies that get away with poison pill defenses year after year after year. And I want to make a suggestion, is it related to the lack of independent directors on the board? Um, and what's, yeah, yeah. So it, the number of pills has actually gone down quite substantially yeah. since uh, the peak, which was late 2000s, early 2010s. Uh, yeah, and so the, the yeah. really, the mega cap companies like the Panasonics and Nippon Steels uh, and so on, they've gotten rid of their pills. Uh, and so it's the, it's the next tier of companies that have kept theirs, the ones that are large enough to be worried uh, because foreign shareholding is, is uh, you know, somewhat significant, but not so large that they really have to uh, care what the asset managers think of them, <laughs> if you will. Uh, and by the way, uh, Japanese domestic asset managers are not in favor of poison pills either. Uh, so who, who is? Who, who is it that's voting for these things? Because they, they usually come to a vote every three years. So how are, how are companies able to keep renewing them every three years? Uh, it tends to be the allegiant shareholders, if you will, the, uh, the business partners, the lenders, the, uh, the employee shareholding associations, uh, company founders, parent companies, all of the insiders or stakeholders. Uh, and so companies that really uh, don't have significant allegiant shareholding, uh, 
have to pay more attention to the views, not of the activists necessarily, but certainly of the mainstream asset managers who may uh, not like poison pills. Yeah. And I want to emphasize here that what, what is it that we don't like about poison pills? It's not even so much the terms of the pill. It's, it's the board that's administering it. And that's, that's where the problem comes in. Because it, if the pill is being administered by a board that's mostly insiders, chances are that it's going to be used for entrenchment. That's my point. I mean, I see the poison pills, the resistance to getting rid of cross shareholdings. Um, you know, it just, it's a signal that many Japanese companies are not ready yet to open up to the rest of the world or even to the rest of Japan. And I saw an article in Nikkei last week, which made me giggle, which was talking about how the, um, this year companies couldn't sell off cross shareholdings because they have to have face-to-face -face meetings to ask for permission <laughs> to sell your share. And because of COVID, they couldn't do that. And again, you know, it just, whether it's like the resistance to getting rid of Hanko of the corporate seal uh, tradition so that you could work at home, there just seems to be like this still remaining concrete block in Japan <laughs> that really doesn't want, that wants to keep its own little tribe protected. We're running out of time and I want to give it to uh, Kondo-san because there are two questions from the audience about if you could talk a little bit about what is the reason for engaging in this reorganization of the TSA and um, what are your intended goals? What do you hope to achieve by reorganizing the, the TSC? And I think you have about four minutes to answer. Okay, okay. So, two uh, minutes. <laughs> so TSC has been Working on the comprehensive market restructuring since last year. And there are three major reasons which made us to do it. And the first three, TSC currently has five market sections. First section and second and the mothers and the JASDAQ standard and JASDAQ growth for companies to be listed. So this is due to the market integration between TSC and Osaka Stock Exchange in 2013. But it is confusing, especially the sections for the emerging small companies. So we are going to restructure them into three new sections with clear concepts. So this is the first reason. And the second reason, we, as I said, we direct to incentivize the listed companies to continuously improve their corporate value by revising our listing and the listing criteria. And the third reason is as a number of the companies listed on the TSC first section has been continuously growing. And now this is more than 2,100 companies. So Topix, the major index in Japan, has become inconvenient to use for investors because all first section companies will be automatically included into Topix under the current correlation method. So we need to tackle this issue to improve the usability of Topix. And on the whole, we'd like to attract more investment into Japanese market. This is the reason behind the ongoing TSC comprehensive market restructure. And so what are the goals that you hope to achieve by this? Goal, goal is, as I said, to attract more investment into Japanese market. <laughs> Yeah, it seems that um, you know when Abe first came into power and announced Abenomics, and he came to New York and he said, "Please buy my Abenomics." There was this huge flood of foreign investment into Japan, which has completely receded. I mean, on the one hand, it's true that activists are putting more money into Japan, but the more bread and butter investors, the mutual funds and the passive funds, they've taken money out of Japan. Why do you think that is? Uh, let me make that the last question to both of you. Why do you think foreigners, ordinary foreigners, foreign investors have become less enthusiastic about Japan? How about Mark? Uh, <laughs> it, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure, but part of it, of course, is, is China. It's the rise of China uh, and just the, the increasing weight of, of China, including Hong Kong, of course, uh, in, in portfolios. Korea to some extent as well, uh, to the extent that uh, you know investors have a certain amount of money that they're going to put in non-home market equities. Uh, you know the, the rise of one market may uh, naturally mean less less investment money available for other other markets. Um, I'm sorry, that's not really a very fair question to ask either of you, but I thought I would. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I I think you probably have to 
ask different investors uh, may have different different reasons for it, but uh, there does seem you know to people. Be, there does seem to be a little bit of fatigue, you know, a little bit of uh, this. This is very common to foreign investors, right? They they get disappointed. I wouldn't say fairly quickly, but somewhat quickly. Yeah, and and look, uh, there's been easy money to be had in the U.S. market, right? In recent years, and part of it is that simply, you know, that that's there's been enormous growth uh, in U.S. equities over the past several years. So uh, why why bother going overseas when you can make this money in your home market? Yeah. I'm being told that we're running out of time. So I want to thank both of our speakers. Um, thank you both very much, Mark and Kondo-san. Hope to see you again. Um, I think that we have a list of our sponsors here that we're going to put up. Um, I want to thank all of these organizations for their very generous financial support to the Center on Japanese Economy and Business. Not only financial support, but most of these companies have become sort of, you know, sources of information and uh, exchange of opinions. And so they've become friends as well as financial sponsors. And it's very, they're all very important to us. So I want to thank them all very much for making this possible. Um, from me, I think the next, I don't have another event in my project until uh, the fall, but I hope that uh, you'll all tune into the next the next series of events when we announce it so have a good rest of your summer stay safe stay well and have a happy summer thank you very much